We're coming to the end of our Money Talks series, and some of you are like, thank God it's over after today. We don't have to deal with this for a while. But the Bible has a lot to say about money. Jesus has a lot to say about money, and it's not just so that you, you can give your money to Beachside. It's not just for that. And I say just for that because, yes, you ought to be giving. We're going to talk about that today. But we want to be wise stewards of what God has given to us. We want to use it to its greatest impact. And so we have had conversations over the last week, first of all, starting with budgeting and just having a plan for what you want to do with your money shouldn't come to the end of the week, the end of the month, or whatever, and wonder what happened to my money. Where did my paycheck go? You ought to have a good plan for what to do with it. And so we spent some time talking about that. We also talked about the importance of getting out of debt and how debt hinders us from being able to make a complete impact for the cause of Christ when it comes to our finances. Maybe some opportunity comes to make an impact, to help dig a well for some orphanage in Nepal or somewhere else as our church has done in the past. And I would love to give, but I just can't because I'm just weighed down with this great burden of debt. And man, the, the potential that's there for us, if we can just be wise stewards of that and spend some time specifically talking to our youngest members who are in the group, that if you can avoid some of the mistakes that all of us have made when it comes to debt, you'll be so much further down the road and have so much more opportunities to do something that can make an impact for eternity. And then last week we talked about saving and investing wisely using what God has given to us to maximize its potential. And so the point of the series is to help each and every one of us all around with our finances. And today we're going to be talking about specifically about giving, and we'll get to that in just a second. I'm going to read a few verses of scripture for you in Matthew chapter number 6. Matthew chapter number 6. Those of you who are a guest today, um, if you're not a follower of Jesus, this really isn't for you. Um, just sit back and try to relax while you're at church and they're talking about money. I will say this, that if, even if you're not a follower of Jesus, if you will follow biblical principles when it comes to money, you will find that the blessings do come with it, even if you're not a follower of Jesus. That's true of any part of your life. Any part of your life, if you will follow biblical principles, whether it's relationships, work, or whatever else, the blessings come with it. Um, if you're not a follower of Jesus, that's the conversation I want to have with you later. Um, but Matthew chapter number 6, specifically talking to followers of Jesus today. Look at verse number 19. It says this, Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth, where moth and rust destroy, and where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day that you've given to us. We thank you for Jesus, our Savior, who gave everything so that we could have eternal life. I continue to lift up those who may be in the room with us, those watching by way of live stream that have yet to trust Jesus Christ as their Savior. I pray today would be the day, and even while we're having this conversation about money and about giving, God, that your Spirit would deal with them on the most important matter of, of, the, of their heart, and that is finding forgiveness, finding new life in Jesus. And God, for followers of Jesus who are here, I pray that you'd really challenge us on this area of finances. God, that each and every one of us would take the next step financially that you want us to take when it comes to being a good steward. Some of us, here we are almost a month later, and we still not taking time to develop that financial plan. And that's the step we need to take. For some of us, we need to get on the road to getting out of debt. It's just weighing us down. It's hindering us from all the things that you want us to accomplish. And I pray 
that today, even in a little way, we would take that step if that's for us. Some of us need to move past that, and now it's time for us to concentrate on our saving, on our investing, on maximizing every single thing that you give to us. God, maybe it's this issue we're going to talk about today, and, and we need to start walking that path of generosity and giving. Lord, work in our hearts. We make a commitment to be obedient to what you tell us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So, Thanksgiving is upon us. We're a few days away from that. Um, for some of you, you're already too late to get your turkey out of the freezer. So depending on how large it is, when you go home today, at least make sure it's out of the freezer. I texted my wife this morning. She was downstairs in the kitchen getting some things ready for lunch today. And I said, can you make sure just get the turkey out of the freezer, please? And so she texts back, got it, done. Like, Perfect, thank you. Why? Because sometimes we forget. And then you go to cook the turkey, and there's still that big chunk of ice inside there, and it's hard to get the neck out and all that other gross stuff that my father-in-law likes. Um, <laughs> giblets and livers, and I don't know what all is in there. Um, he loves all that kind of stuff, but it's, if it's frozen in there, that, that's difficult. So when we think of Thanksgiving, number one thing people think of, food. Food, food right? So we've got this... Beautiful plate of Thanksgiving food I want to pop up here for you. None of you are hungry yet. Everybody had breakfast right before they got here. So you think about the Thanksgiving dinner, and if you're thinking about your plate, right? Um, earlier, earlier, we had a conversation with those connected with me on social media about, hey, what one Thanksgiving food would you get rid of if you could get rid of one thing? Green bean casserole ca caught some heat with that. I don't know what that's about. But I want to flip that coin and talk about, okay, what's the one thing like I have to have? If I don't have any other Thanksgiving food, it's got to be this one thing in particular. What's the one most important thing for you, Violet? All right, mashed potatoes and gravy. Okay, who else is all about the mashed potatoes and gravy? All right, what else? What else is your go-to? Yes. Got to have the mac and cheese. All right, rolls, and not just anybody can make mac and cheese for Thanksgiving. I've seen some of these pictures where it's like, oh my Lord, that looks horrible. <laughs> if your mac and cheese is dry, you should not be cooking mac and cheese, okay? So I'm just saying, it should be creamier than creamy. All right. Yes, what do you like? My mom's homemade stuffing. Mom's homemade stuffing. How many of you are homemade stuffing people? All right, you guys are weird. Where's my stovetop? Who likes the box stovetop? Yeah, that's the correct answer. That is the correct answer. All right. Yes, what do you like? Sweet potato souffle. That sounds way too fancy for me. And it's got the word sweet potato in it, so that's a no-go for me. But yes. Yes, turkey. There it is. How many of you like turkey? Where's the turkey people? If you don't like turkey, it's because you've never had it from somebody who knows how to cook it. All right, so turkey's great. So here's what happens. We make this giant feast for Thanksgiving, and we always make way too much, but you want to have more food, not enough, right? So we have all these leftovers, and then we've got to figure out what we're going to do with them. How many of you like the leftovers? Uh, me neither. I don't either. How many of you like the leftovers more than when it was first made? All right, we got a lot of those people that like leftovers. What's your favorite thing to make leftover with the, the Thanksgiving stuff? Turkey soup. All right, sandwiches, turkey soup. Yeah. Bread stuffing, cranberry sauce? Okay. I'll take your word for it. Um, it's, it should, sauce should be in quotes though, right? Cranberry, cranberry sauce? It's more like gelatin, right? But, um, yeah, I don't do that either. So, um, that's what we do here at Beachside. We, we cause division, that's... It's my Baptist background, I apologize. Um, 
So we have, you got our plate, right? We eat as much as we want, and we have our leftovers, and um, this, is, this is the plate that we often give to God. This is the plate we give to God. God, I've had all I want. You can have whatever left on a turkey leg. Got a little bit of mashed potatoes. A hint of gravy on there for you. This is, this is what we give to God when it comes often to our finances. And we often, if that, give God just, just what's left over. And when we think about what he's told us today, we want to we have the right attitude on everything that God has given to us. So we're in Matthew chapter number 6, and Jesus is having this conversation. And as we've read already, but we'll kind of walk through it here as we get started into this money talk today, where he says this, Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth. And one of the things that we have been talking about is it's not wrong to have money. It is not wrong to have stuff. We have some people in our congregation that God has blessed immensely that are pretty well off financially. Nothing wrong with that. Now, if you're on the other end of the spectrum, where you're living paycheck to paycheck and you're having a hard time, that doesn't mean you're somehow less than the person who has stuff. Or has money. So I want to kind of put that out there right away. He's not saying it's wrong to have money. It's wrong to have stuff. We talked about last week how it's, it is the love of money that is the root of all evil. Money's not evil. Money is a tool. It's something that can be used for good or bad. What he's trying to relate to us is storing up treasure in this life should not be the main goal for all of us especially as a follower of Jesus. So that should not be the main goal for us. Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth, he says, where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. Right? Because all those things are going to be done with. They're going to pass away. You've heard the phrase. We've talked about it the last couple of weeks. You cannot take it with you. I, I, I made a, a little post yesterday about church today and was talking about that in there, and somebody said, uh, made a comment about the Egyptians did it, right? But no, they're the greatest pharaohs, they're dead and gone, their, their gold is still here, right? You can't take it with you. But we do have the opportunity to send it ahead by investing in the things that truly matter for eternity. So he says, don't let that be your focus on the here and the now. Instead, verse number 20, lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal. And then he makes this statement, powerful statement in verse number 21. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. And so that is the point of what Jesus is trying to say here. And he gives us this valuable barometer to see what is truly important to us. There is something about, and I don't have my wallet in my pocket, uh, something about that wallet, something about that money that is so closely tied to our hearts. I don't understand it. I don't know what it's about. Jesus did, and so he said, hey, let's talk about it for a second. Because that can tell us what is truly important to us. We can say all kinds of stuff about what's important to us. Jesus says, if you really want to see, look at your bank account. And you'll find out what's important to you. Now, the great thing about that is, we can use money to change where our heart is. So if my heart is here and I want it to be over here, I can start putting finances here and my heart is going to go with it. And so he challenges us, what is our ultimate focus? We can say we love God and that he's a priority to us, but do our wallets back that up? Um, if you have your Bible, turn to Malachi chapter number 3. 
Malachi chapter number 3. And uh, Old Testament book, the, it is in your Bible, it is the last book of the Old Testament. For those of you that don't know, your Bible is divided into basically two parts. The Old Testament is the Hebrew Bible, and um, it would be the very last book in that Hebrew Bible. And then we have the New Testament, or the New Covenant. We talked about that in our Covenant series, what that's all about. Um, and that picks up where Jesus is born and talks about his life and letters to the churches and all of that. So in Malachi chapter number 3, there's a conversation that's taking place. We'll pick up the conversation in verse number 8. It says this, Will a man rob God? So he's asking a very specific question. Will a man rob God? Now, if we were to ask, if somebody was to ask you that, like I personally went up to you and would say, hey, would you rob God? You'd have the same response they would have. Like, no, of course I wouldn't. Like, I would never think of trying to steal from God. So he continues on. He says, yet you are robbing me. Would you rob God? No, God, I would, I would never rob you. He says, you, you are robbing me. But you say, how have we robbed you? In your tithes and contributions. You are cursed with a curse, for you are robbing me, the whole nation of you. Bring the full tithe into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house, and thereby put me to the test, says the Lord of hosts, if I will not open the windows of heaven for you and pour down for you a blessing until there is no more need. So he's having this conversation about robbing, and he says, no, you have robbed me. Well, how do we rob you? And he uses this phrase, in your tithes and contributions, verse number 8. So that word tithe, for some of you, may be a brand new word. Maybe you didn't grow up in church or whatever else. That word tithe simply means tenth. That's what it means, 10% tithe. And so he had instructed them a certain thing, and, and we won't get into a big conversation about tithes. The nation of Israel was actually supposed to give three tithes. Um, one tithe was for religious reasons. One tithe was like basically a governmental tax that went to the government. One tithe was given every third year to help take care of the poor and the needy. So they actually were supposed to give 23 and a third percent. Um, but he says, you've, you've robbed me with this, this tithe. And we've talked about the tithe in the budgeting a little bit, when we talked about budgeting, and talked about, hey, with the tithe, you ought to give it to God first. Like, so when we're developing our budget, if I'm a follower of Jesus, my main priority is God. God has given me absolutely everything. And some people have the wrong idea about money. Like, they think, okay, 10% belongs to God, and 90% is mine to do whatever I want to do with it. And that is the wrong attitude for money. Everything you and I have has been given to us by God. Every good gift, every perfect gift comes from above. That's what the scripture tells us, including the ability to work and make an income and all those things. So everything has been given to us by God. So when we talk about tithing, God is saying, hey... I want you to show your dependence upon me. I want you to show your trust in me and your thankfulness for everything that I have provided for you. We won't get into a long discussion about the first fruits and all of that. There's solid biblical principles for why we put it in our budget to give to God first. And that ought to be a priority for you. And then there's the question of, well, do I give from my gross or do I give from my net? And this is my opinion, my suggestion, is you should give from your gross. You say, well, why do you think that? You give to the government from your gross. Like, you give, you give to Uncle Sam. You say, well, I don't have a choice in that. Well, true. You, I mean, you do, but there's penalties for that, right? And I would think, well, why are we treating God with less value than we would treat the government? But that's a whole other story in and of itself. So then we talked about tithing also when um, we talked about saving. So we, we gave the 108010 and talked about that. If you're saving, this is a great place for starting. 
Um, we had some conversations in our connection groups, great conversations this past month about finances and all of that. This is a, a great place to start. Now, as you start to pay off debt and everything else, these numbers are going to shift where now you're, you're, this is giving 10, say, uh, living off 80, saving 10 for those that are unfamiliar with 10, 80, 10. Um, so if you're paying off debt and everything, you're going you're gonna to start to save more than just 10, right? But maybe, I know for my wife and I, our, our numbers are different. So our first number is 20. And it's been that way since before we got married. But whatever that number is, it's like, okay, I give to God first. He is my first priority. Um, and, you know, you, you have these conversations about people with, with giving. And for some people, like, it's a hard conversation for them to have. And there's a lot of different reasons for that. Some because of things that have happened in the past, whether it's they've gone to a church that didn't handle finances well or didn't talk about finances well, that, that made people feel guilty or whatever else. Um, and so it can, I understand it can be a very difficult conversation to have. And here God is asking the nation of Israel, saying, hey, would you rob God? And they're like, of course I would. I would never rob God. Well, you did. Well, how did I do that? In my tithes and my contributions. And I'm sure they had all kinds of different reasons. All kinds of different excuses. And we're, we're pretty good at coming up with excuses. Some people, they say, well, I don't really give money to the church, but I give my time. Give my time to the church. Now, time and money aren't the same, even though it says time equals money, right? Um... And even if you say, well, that my time, I give my time, I don't give my money, I doubt you give God 10% of your time. 16.8 hours a week? For some people, it's hard just being here a little over an hour. But time, that doesn't, that doesn't equal out. Well, I use my talents, and so I kind of serve, and I do this or that. I mean, that's great. You should serve. We all should, as followers of Jesus. But see, church is the only place, God is the only person that we use those excuses with. You know, the government's hired thousands of people to, for the IRS to audit you. Auditor comes, hey, how come you didn't pay your taxes? Well, I don't, I don't really give money to the IRS, I'll give them my time instead. To see, see how they like that. Or, let's say, your water bill comes. I'm not going to send money in, Nick. I'll, I'll give my time. To, Nick's like, I would take your time, actually, to help with my job. But here's the thing. Nick works, he works down there, right? His main job is to oversee the cleaning and all of that of our water so we have clean water. I would almost guarantee that even though he works there, they send him a water bill, and he's got to pay it. Say, but I'm the one literally cleaning the water. See, it doesn't work anywhere else in society. Try it with your mortgage lender or anyone else. Go to the grocery store. You can't. For some reason, God is the only one we say that to. God is the only one we use that excuse with try to make ourselves feel better for not being a good steward of what he's given to us with. And so he says, hey, you've robbed me. And it's so interesting the way that people are because when we, we have a need, we go to God, right? We go to God and we ask him, as, as long as the preacher doesn't take too long today, we're going to have a prayer time after this. Right? And we're going to lift up our request to him, and we ought to do that. But we go to God and we say, God, I'm in need. I need this. I need that. And a lot of times it is financial and different things where we're, we have a, a true need. And we go to God and we say, God, I, I trust you to provide for my need. But for some reason, we have a hard time trusting him on the front end of things. 
If I give to God first, then I won't have money to pay my bills. I won't have money for food. I won't have, and, and we have a hard time trusting him on the front end, but we have no problem going and asking him on the back end. And so he says, hey, you've robbed me. Now, he talks about being cursed with a curse. We know from our series, Jesus became a curse for us. We are not cursed. So we're not going to talk about a curse. But he does talk about and hammers home the idea of a blessing. He makes this statement, bring all the tithes into the storehouse so there'll be food in my house. He says, hey, bring it all in. And this is the, the part that as a ministry leader, as a church, I see happening in the church world. These are not my statistics. Um, I went to a pastor's conference, and one of the sessions had to do with um, an organization that helps bring in tithes digitally. So it has to do with digital giving. It's not a company we use here at Beachside. It's some other company. And so... They deal with thousands and thousands of churches of all sizes all around the world. And what they, their statistics tell them is that churches are running on about a fourth of what they could be. If everybody just gave 10%, churches could do four times as much. Help four times as many people. And I think about even here at Beachside. If everybody gave just 10%, you say, that's a lot for some people. It is, but we're just talking about what the system that he has designed. Right? If everybody gave 10%, we wouldn't have special talks about, hey, we've got Christmas Eve service, uh, Christmas Eve outreach coming, and we need some money for this. We wouldn't have talks about, hey, we're going to do Easter on the beach, we need to raise a couple thousand dollars to help with that. Like, we wouldn't have to have any of those conversations. Because every outreach that we felt like God wanted us to do, it would just, the money would just be there. The impact we could make, at least four times as much. He's designed this system to work. And he says, hey, bring it all in so there can be food in my house. And then he gives us this promise to challenge him. And we hear it all the time, hey, don't test God. Don't test God. This is one area where God says, I'm giving you an exception. You test me. Put me to the test, he says. And if you want to put that, that verse back up there, Malachi chapter 3, verse number 10. He says this. Bring the full tithe into the storehouse that there may be food in my house. And thereby put me to the test, says the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies is what that means. If I will not open the windows of heaven for you and pour down for you a blessing until there is no more need. He says, you test me. You put me first. You trust me on the front end. You give like you're supposed to and you see if I won't bless you. If I won't take care of you. If I won't provide for you. He says, I will open up the windows of heaven to the point where you have no more need. And he's not saying, hey, you write a check, God will send you a check. It's not what he's saying. He's saying, I will provide for you. I will bless you. We see Jesus say the same thing when he says, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. The things he's talking about is the food, the clothing, the shelter, the needs that you have. He says, you put me first and you see how I won't take care of you. David says, I've never seen the righteous begging bread. Not one time. But sometimes we have a hard time on the front end trusting him. God, I'm, I'm afraid that if I give, I won't have what I need. God says, try me. Try me and see if I won't pour out that blessing and take care of you. Because he will every single time. Um, but there's people that have this argument like, okay, I understand Malachi, I understand what he's saying about tithing, but pastor, that's, that's the Old Testament, that's under the Old Testament law. And I'm like, true, that's a true statement. That, that's given under Old Testament law. Except, except 
the tithe was actually demonstrated before the Old Testament law was ever given. Open your Bibles to Genesis chapter number 14. Genesis chapter number 14. Nancy read some verses for us a second ago, and you probably heard some names and thought, what in the world's happening here? May not have understood what's going on. Um, We're going to pick up in verse number 18. This is a long time before God gave Moses those Ten Commandments and then all the other laws that went with it. So we talked about the way the children of Israel were supposed to tithe. This goes before that even. It tells us, verse 18, and Melchizedek, king of Salem, we don't have time to get into that conversation. I would love to. I'm going to avoid a rabbit trail here. Um, okay, I'm going I'm to move on. I want to talk about it, but I won't. Um, Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought out bread and wine. There's another conversation we could have. He was priest of God most high. And he blessed him and said, Blessed be Abram by God most high, possessor of heaven and earth, and blessed be God most high, who has delivered your enemies into your hand. It says, I'm going to have you help me here. And Abram gave him a what? A tenth of everything. So tenth, remember, means tithe. So this is way before the law was given to the children of Israel. Abram is standing here with the priest of the Most High God and gives him a tenth of everything. So we, we have this demonstrated way before the Old Testament law is even given. Now some of you are still like, yeah, but still, that is in the Old Testament. You know, Jesus came and he changed everything. And so now we can't be expected to do that, can we? I'm glad you asked. Turn to your Bible to Matthew chapter number 23. Matthew chapter number 23. Jesus is having a conversation with some religious leaders. And he's... I love it because he has given these religious leaders a very hard time. We often have this picture of Jesus that isn't scripturally accurate, that he's somehow, you know, this very quiet, very timid, very passive, which is the exact opposite of who he was. Jesus knew when to be timid. He knew when to be passive. He also knew when he had to step forward with boldness and flip over some tables. Must have played Monopoly with my wife. Um... (laughs) But he he knew when to be pretty harsh. And against the religious leaders who thought they had it all figured out and thought they were better than everybody else, he was pretty harsh. When he he talked with those who were down and out, cast out of society, he was very loving, very gentle. His approach to people was amazing. But he's having this conversation, verse 23. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! Hypocrites! For you tithe mint and dill and cumin and have neglected the weightier matters of the law, justice and mercy and faithfulness. These you ought to have done without neglecting the others. So they're pretty serious about their tithing. So my wife has has a bottle of herbs here. I'm going to ask her to bring them up here. And she's going to help me today. So I'm going to dump this on the floor and I'm going to need I'm going to need you to count out exactly 10% and and put that out okay I'd like to pass Are you serious? Yeah, is that not okay? Are you not willing to do that for Jesus? I will do it for Jesus, not for you but Okay. Jesus. Um no, I I won't make you do that. So you may be seated. All right. So I have I have this bottle of herbs here, right? And this is how particular these religious leaders were. They would go through and literally count out 10% of what is in here. So when he talks about paying tithe of mint and all this stuff on your herbs, on your spices, they're literally counting it out 10% exactly. They were very diligent in their giving towards God. Problem was they didn't have the right heart with it. And they kind of left off some very important things when he talks about justice, mercy, faithfulness. 
So they were so careful to make sure I give exactly 10% of my mint. But then they weren't meeting out justice like they were supposed to. They weren't merciful. Now notice what Jesus says. He says, these you ought to have done. You ought to pay tithe on the herbs, he said, and the spices. He didn't say, don't worry about tithing. He said, you ought to have done that without neglecting the others. All right, do both. It's not either or. It's not one or the other. Yes, pay, pay your tithe. Do your tithe like you're supposed to. But also, have justice. Have mercy. Be faithful. You shouldn't have done one without the other. You should have done them both. Even Jesus said when it came to taxes, hey, render under Caesar the things that are Caesar's. Render to God the things that are God's. So even Jesus talks about the importance and affirms the fact of paying tithe in the New Testament. Hey, don't leave one, don't do one and neglect the other, is what he tells these religious leaders. Yeah, but that's, that's Jesus. That was before he died. All right, let's keep moving forward. 2 Corinthians chapter number 8. 2 Corinthians chapter number 8. I have the Apostle Paul writing here to these believers in Corinth. He says this, talking to these Christians. We want you to know, brothers, about the grace of God that has been given among the churches of Macedonia. So he's going to talk about these Christians in Macedonia and something so powerful about them. He says this, verse 2, For in a severe test of affliction, their abundance of joy and their extreme poverty have overflowed in a wealth of generosity on their part. So he talks about these Christians, and it was not the popular thing to be a Christian during this time period, by the way. They would lose their job, lose their family, face persecution, maybe even death and imprisonment. So they're struggling to the point where they're in extreme poverty, but he says that has led to an overflow in a wealth of generosity on their part. For they gave according to their means, as I can testify, and beyond their means... Notice what it says, of their own accord. Nobody's twisting their arm. Nobody's trying to guilt them into giving. They had a desire to give. He says it went so far, verse 4, begging us earnestly for the favor of taking part in the relief of the saints. And this not as we expected, but they gave themselves first to the Lord, then by the will of God to us. See, this is why they could be so generous. Because they had given themselves to God first. God, everything I have belongs to you. Everything that I am belongs to you. And the, and the fact of the matter is, when we give ourselves and everything we have to God, we turn it over, we surrender it to him. If God lays it on our heart to give, I got no problem with that. Why? Because I've already given God everything that I am. Everything that I have. God, you want, to write me a, you want me to write a check to help this missionary go to Nepal and preach the gospel? No problem. I'm happy to do that. God, you want me to use my house as a way to reach people for Jesus, connection groups and other things? No problem. I can do that. God, you want me to use my car to go pick up people and bring them to church, take them to doctor's appointments and other things? I can do that. No problem. Why? Because we've given ourselves first. And so even though they were in extreme poverty, they had such a desire to be so generous because they'd given themselves to God first. He says this, Accordingly, we urge Titus that as he had started, so he should complete among you this act of grace. The act of grace has to do with giving, has to do with generosity. And one of the things that, that Paul's dealing with here is he's trying to get them to follow through on some things that they'd already said. They said they wanted to give, said they wanted to be generous, said they wanted to help, and they hadn't followed through yet. And so Titus is there to help them follow through on what they said they were going to do. And he says this in verse 7, But as you excel in everything... In faith, in speech, in knowledge, in all earnestness, and in, your and in our love for you, 
See that you excel in this act of grace also. And I love this, because he, he, does, he does the right thing, right? When we're going to confront somebody, you got to deal with a certain issue, they always tell you, like, say some positive stuff first. So he talks about the positives. And he says, man, you guys are so great in your faith, in your speech, in your knowledge, in all earnestness, in your love. But when it comes to being generous, you're kind of lagging behind. You've got some room to grow. And here at Beachside, we don't hide from the fact that we want to help you grow in your generosity. That looks different for everybody. Everybody here is at a different place in their pathway to generosity. For some of you, it is a big step for you to give anything to a church ever. The first time, that is a hard step to make. And there can be a lot of different reasons for that. And I recognize that. For some of you, you're not going to jump from not giving at all to giving God 10% or more. That's too big of a gap. So some of you, the step you need to take in generosity and growing is just giving anything to God. Putting a dollar in the basket. Putting a dollar in the little thing that's back by the table. That's it. That's a big step for some people. For others, yeah, they've given something. And they need to take the next step of giving something sometimes. In other words, just every so often putting money in the basket. Every so often going on digitally and giving your offering there. Some do need to take that step of 10%. Like that's exactly what God is telling you to do, to move into that area of faith and trusting God in your finances and giving that 10%. Some of you are already there. And God's asking you to go further. Just like he's asked me and my wife to go further. It's difficult. We're all at our own place. But he's challenging us to grow in this area of generosity. And he says, I want you to excel in this also. And what I love in verse number eight, Paul's good at this. Paul's way better than a lot of pastors I've heard. Where he says, verse eight, I say this not as a command, but to prove by the earnestness of others that your love also is genuine. He's saying, I'm not commanding you to do this. I'm not commanding you to give to help these other Christians. It's what he's telling them. And I love that he's up front about that. Because a lot of times you might hear a pastor or somebody else say something, and it's their thoughts and their ideas, and they treat it as if it's like a command straight from God. Now, I believe giving is a command straight from God. These Christians here, they didn't have to give to help this church over here. We already looked at the biblical principles for giving to God and giving to him first. But he says this, verse 9, ultimate example of generosity. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that you by his poverty might become rich. And he says, hey, Jesus is the ultimate example of what it looks like to be generous, of holding nothing back in reserve, of giving everything. You think about what Jesus gave for you. He held nothing back. God the Father held nothing back for you. In fact, Paul goes on to say, hey, God gave his own son for you. How will he not freely give you all things? Like, he's going to bless you. He's going to take care of you. And yet we have such a hard time trusting him on that front end. We hold back. We have so many reservations. When he says, hey, Jesus, he didn't hold anything back for you. Why are you holding back from him? And so what a great challenge here when it comes to giving. It's growing in it. Growing in your generosity. Following his ultimate example. And here's the thing. It doesn't matter who you are in here or what your financial status is. God has blessed you greatly. He has blessed me greatly. He has entrusted us with earthly treasure to use to its ultimate impact for him. And the question is, are we using it wisely? Are we just storing up treasure for the here and now? Are we storing up treasure in heaven? 
a wise steward will give to God and will give to God generously. Matthew chapter number 6, beginning verse 19, says this, Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth, where moth and rust destroy, and where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust destroys, and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also.